Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines, Algerian forces arrest student protesters amid crackdown on Iraq protests. Student workers extend strike to demand fair pay, pay and benefits in the US. Israeli airstrikes kill one civilian and just six in Syria. And in our video section, we take a look at the necessity of global vaccination to effectively fight the COVID-19 pandemic. In our first story, we go to Algeria, where dozens of students were arrested on Tuesday. They were attempting to gather in the capital of Algiers for the weekly demonstrations as part of the Hirak protests. However, the demonstrators were violently dispersed by the police and many were detained and taken to police stations. As per updates by the National Committee for the Release of Detainees, at least 25 people were later released. However, around six protest organizers and leaders continue to be in detention. This is the second week in a row that police have disrupted the students' demonstration. May 4th would have marked the 115th Tuesday as part of the anti-government protests in Algeria. Protests have continued despite an escalating police crackdown, especially throughout the month of April. As was reported by media organizations, at least 750 protesters were arrested and questioned by security forces across Algeria. 78 people were placed under judicial custody and at least 43 were imprisoned. Arrested protesters have been accused of undermining national security and causing damage to national unity. Journalists also held a protest in Algiers on May 3rd to mark the World Press Freedom Day. They demanded that all detained journalists being held in pre-trial detention be released. These include Rabba Karish, who has been detained since April 19th. Karish was accused of spreading hate and discrimination while he was covering a Hirak protest. Since the start of the movement in 2019, the Algerian state has banned several news portals and arrested and imprisoned journalists. The police have also been accused of torturing activists during interrogation and detention. In our next story, we go to the US where a strike by student workers at New York University has entered its second week. Over 2,200 students have been organized by the Graduate Student Organizing Committee. The GSOC is part of the United Auto Workers Union. The strike was launched on April 26th following multiple failed negotiations for a fair contract. The GSOC has argued that the NYU administration has not come to the bargaining table in good faith. The administration has also deployed pressure tactics to break the strike, including emailing the parents of the striking students. Graduate students at New York University are employed on an hourly basis and teaching is not included in the stipend that the PhD students receive. Student workers have been demanding a tiered wage hike system. This would include a hike of $1 per hour for master's students and $2 per hour for doctoral students. However, the university has only offered a general wage hike of $1 per hour for all students. Other issues include the proposed cuts to teaching positions for graduate students, the presence of police inside the campus and better healthcare coverage. The strike has received widespread support from students and teachers, Student unions from other universities have also planned a solidarity picket on May 5th. The strike at NYU is part of a broader wave of labor mobilizations in the UN's US student workers community. These included Illinois State University, where students voted in favor of a strike on April 22nd. A strike at Oregon Institute of Technology ended on May 4th after securing a tentative deal. Student workers at Columbia University have also rejected the tentative agreement offered by the administration. The strike is expected to continue after it was halted by the bargaining committee last month. One civilian has been killed and six others were injured during Israeli airstrikes on Syria. The seven casualties were reported after one of the strikes hit a civilian plastics factory. According to a statement by Syrian army, the strikes targeted the country's northwestern region in the early hours of May 5th. The raid hit the port city of Latakia in the Mediterranean Sea and the towns of Hifa and Misyaf. A report by Reuters has said that the Israeli raid also struck several areas in the town of Jabla. The Syrian army announced that its air defense system had intercepted and shot down some of the missiles. Israel has targeted, escalated its attacks on Syria, claiming that it is targeting Iranian-backed militias in the country. This is the claim that Iran has repeatedly denied. According to one estimate, Israel carried out almost 1,000 such covert and unconfirmed airstrikes on Syria between 2017 and 20. Intelligence company Jane stated last month that Israel had used 4,239 weapons in a three-year span. 70% of Israeli pilots have been involved in these attacks against 955 targets. The airstrikes carried out this year alone have killed at least 10 soldiers and almost 50 government allied fighters. While Israel rarely acknowledges these attacks, the Syrian government has denounced them as a violation of the UN Charter and has asked the UN Security Council to intervene. And finally, we take a look at efforts to expand vaccine access across the world. Around 70% of people in G7 countries support patent waivers for the production of COVID-19 vaccines. They believe that while manufacturers should be fairly compensated for developing the vaccines, they should not hold a monopoly on the jabs. These findings are the result of a survey released by the People's Vaccine Alliance. Members of the World Trade Organization have consistently blocked proposals by countries such as India and South Africa to waive these patents. Meanwhile, health experts have warned that the spread of the virus could render current vaccines ineffective within a year. 
As per a survey, 88% also stated that the persistent low vaccine coverage would make it likely for vaccine-resistant mutants to appear. Here is Dr. Satyajit Rath to talk more about these issues. Are currently grappling with Jan Chakowski, one of the uh, US uh, uh, members of Congress, is uh, uh, putting together an appeal to the US president to uh, put the presidential administration's weight behind the India South Africa proposal for uh, the waiver that, that you made reference to. And the opposition comes within the US Congress and Senate from pharma company uh, funded uh, legislators through their talking points. And their talking point has been the one that you alluded to, which is, you know, let's not touch patents because patents are not really the problem. It's the entire technological landscape that is the problem. And that as Mr. Gates and the pharma company point out is simply something that is not easily taught. And therefore, you know, just, just leave it to us to do it as best as we can. And that is a fundamental problem. It's a fundamental problem because all the licensure agreements, for example, between the COVID-19 vaccine designers of the Global North and the vaccine scale manufacturers of the Global South, such as in India, the um, uh, agreement with the Serum Institute of India, the agreement with Bharat Biotech, which has its own partnership agreements with uh, vaccine makers in the global north, with Biological E, with, you know, the, with Dr. Reddy's laboratories, all of these, easily a dozen vaccine manufacturers in India have no difficulties with putting together and learning and absorbing the vaccine technologies of the global north without any startup limitations. In fact, the Serum Institute itself has an ongoing arrangement with Novavax for a completely different technological platform altogether. So in all of this, I don't see the problem as being one of difficulty in teaching companies of the global south how to do things. I see the real problem as being working out the commercial licensure arrangements. And it is that delay and that limitation that is serving as the major rate limiting factor. If that rate limiting factor was at least alleviated, if not eliminated, then we would have a much larger scale of manufacture with not simply companies in India, but companies in Malaysia, companies in South Africa, companies in Argentina, com companies in Brazil, companies in Mexico, at least one or maybe two companies in uh, West Africa. So in all of this- And in Bangladesh. In all of this, we are therefore looking at commercial considerations limiting the rate of expansion of manufacturing scale, not technological limitations. And that is the fundamental point that I think it's important to keep. Vaccine capacity with perceptions that are built, as I said earlier, on differences in regulatory regime uh, uh, perceptions rather than in technologies, efficacies, or anything else, but they are being used for the obvious purpose of geopolitical power games on the one hand. And I think that this is an extraordinarily callous response to a global pandemic. But going beyond that, it is the inevitable outcome of a fundamental choice that all countries of the world seem to have made, which is that public good in a pandemic is going to come out of the greed of the capitalist marketplace. And once you give in to that, the commercial jockeying for profit advantage, which is really the other face of what you describe, is an inevitability. And that's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch.